work on the personalized neuromodulation to re to enhance life participation for children with hemiparesis, the SPORT trial. Dr. Curtin is a professor of pediatrics, radiology, and clinical neurosciences at the University of Calgary and an attending pediatric neurologist at the Alberta Children's Hospital. He holds the Dr. Robert Haslam Chair in Pediatric Neurology. Dr. Curtin's research focuses on applying neurotechnologies to generate new opportunities for life participation for children with disabilities. He directs the Calgary Pediatric Stroke Program and the ACH Brain Computer, Inter Computer Interface Laboratory. After Dr. Curtin's presentation, we will invite a small panel to join him, answer some questions, and then we'll open it up to a general Q&A. Dr. Curtin. Great, thanks, Leticia. Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks for inviting us. Um, you'll meet, I guess, the rest of our team who's joining on the panel. I'm here, really representing a, a diverse group of our uh, of our team who've uh, contributed in many ways to the uh, sport trial, which is what we were asked to uh, talk about. So uh, happy to do that. Um, do you have my slides, Leticia? Or do you want me to just share them off my screen? You don't mind sharing them from your screen? Yeah, that's fine. Let me just uh, do that. Okay, you guys seeing my slides now? Let me just start the show here. Good. Yep, great, thanks. Okay, so um, uh, thanks for inviting us. The, um, the sport trial really represents um, a, a body of work that we've been doing here at the Children's for more than 10 years. And um, it's almost done. It's uh, this great timing because we're just wrapping up the trial. and. What I hope I can uh, share with you is uh, an overall concept that that's evolved around this that I hope is of interest to this group. I know it's a fairly diverse um, uh, audience, so I'm, I'm not going to get too detailed about you know um, neuroscience and and some of the the things that interest us here, uh, but more about how do we um, do patient centered, family centered. Uh, clinical trial design around a common problem uh, with the goals and interests of, of the kids themselves in mind. Um, how do we do that to see if emerging uh, neurotechnologies can actually work? Can they actually uh, help kids to function better, achieve their goals? Um, that's really what this is all about. So I'll give you a, just a sort of a 20 minute background of and the and the details of the trial and where it's at. And then we'll open it up for, I think, the panel and what should be a very general discussion and happy to, to uh, uh, take that uh, wherever it goes. Um, I don't have any really significant disclosures. Um, I'll talk a bit about brainstem, not VCI today, which are experimental uh, therapies. So I'm not making any recommendations. And we have a company that's starting out of this, but I have no, no financial conflicts of interest. Okay, so... This is an MRI scan um, of a one-day-old baby who had a term birth, a healthy mom, healthy delivery, and nothing out of the ordinary, but they had a seizure on the first day of life. And, and this is what we see in our neonatal intensive care unit. And so we took this baby to the MRI scanner. And for those who aren't used to looking at this, it's this called a diffusion MRI, but bright is bad. And so everything bright here on the right of your screen, which is actually the left side of the baby's brain, uh, is uh, permanently damaged. This is a stroke. Uh, this is the entire middle cerebral artery territory. So this is a big, not just a stroke, this is a big stroke. And uh, if you or I had a stroke like this, we would be devastated. We would lose the ability to speak. We would be paralyzed on one side. Uh, you might even die from a stroke like this. And this baby, in contrast, um, is, is going to have problems. They're, they're going to have cerebral palsy. That's, that's a form of weakness on one side of the body. Uh, but many children with this brain injury will otherwise do quite well. Uh, not all of them, unfortunately, but, but many can. And a lot of that we're learning has to do with not the big injury that your attention is drawn to on the right side here. It's all this pristine, perfect, uh, uninjured brain uh, especially in the other hemisphere, the other side of the brain, this is the beginning of life. So this brain is is a almost a blank slate and has incredible potential to develop in the face of an injury like this to create function. And, and this is really at the root of what interests us 
and um, and the kind of story that I'll I'll tell you about. Um, so I'm going to sh show you some other real patients. Um, this is Alana, uh, who was one of our early program participants. This is her back when she was about 13, and she had a stroke similar to that uh, that I just showed you when she around the time she was born. She has cerebral palsy, weakness on one side. But her one of her goals in life was to become a ski racer, and she has done that uh, to an unbelievable degree of success. So she is a highly awarded, number one ranked in the world uh, in in multiple uh, skiing events. She's been to multiple Olympics and won medals for Canada in the Paralympics. Um, so not only did she survive and thrive after that brain injury, she became a high performance athlete uh, on an international scale and. So Elena is an outlier. Of course, she's been extremely successful. Uh, but how did her brain do that? How it, it was such a bad injury at the beginning of life. How can she now be this successful young adult uh, uh, racing down mountains all over the world? It's uh, it, it's amazing. And it, it's, it, it's at the root of what really interests us. So I have uh, three learning objectives for you. First, a, a bit of a primer on what stroke in the newborn or what we call perinatal stroke is and, and why it might happen. The second is to give you an idea of how the brain might develop around that. And third, how do we use that information to then to design new approaches to treatment to try to improve outcomes? So first, a bit about stroke, uh, perinatal stroke. A lot of people are surprised to hear that kids have strokes, but they do. And in fact, the perinatal time period, that is when you're a fetus or right after you're born, is actually very high risk uh, uh, for having stroke of, of different kinds. You don't have to worry too much about the details, but if you want to know more, this is a nice review from Mary Dunbar, who just finished her fellowship with us. Um, these are all, there are different types of stroke in the newborn, but they're all, just like on the first MRI I showed you, they're all focal vascular brain injuries. So they create a, a, a usually a single injury on one side of the brain. And that is particularly helpful or interesting, as you'll see, because it gives us a model in, in real developing children of uh, a healthy side and an injured side, how does the brain develop? Um, uh, and you'll see hopefully why that becomes relevant. Um, you're all, you didn't know it probably, but you're all living in the hotbed of perinatal stroke research. This is Alberta, of course, and we're very lucky here because we have this big population-based sample. It's really hard to generate these, but we're, we're lucky to do that in Alberta. And another nice paper of Mary's has shown the incidence of this is about one out of every thousand live births, which that sounds kind of rare, uh, but it actually makes it a, a very common problem in our practice. And we follow uh, hundreds and hundreds of families in Alberta affected by perinatal stroke, over a thousand actually. Um, everybody wants to know why would a baby have a stroke? Doesn't, doesn't sound like it really makes sense. And we're still trying to figure that out. What I'm showing you on the right here is a, a, a culmination of about a half a dozen uh, well done studies trying to look at the factors of the mom, the pregnancy, the delivery. Could we ever you know, understand why would a baby be at risk of stroke? And our group has published a few of these. And, and the truth is, we still really can't identify. We don't know which pregnancy is going to incur a perinatal stroke. But we're pretty, uh, pretty clear on what the most likely mechanism is. And sorry if this is a bit of a confusing cartoon. What it's trying to show you is what we think happens in most cases. This is a blown up picture of what the placenta looks like under a microscope. And if the placenta gets sick with infection or inflammation or thrombosis. If you remember, um, for those of you who went to med school or did physiology, the, the, the placenta is your sole source of oxygen uh, as, a, as a fetus before you're born. And if a blood clot was to leave the placenta and enter the circulation of the fetus, uh, it most of that blood goes right out to the left side of the heart and up to the brain. And so clots leaving the placenta and blocking arteries in the brain is probably accounts for the vast majority. And I won't tell you much more about, about what we're doing acutely in neonatal stroke, other than to say these are exciting times. This is a, a sweet little baby uh, patient of mine. She was the first that we enrolled in something called the dinosaur trial. Um, we're now into the age of neuroprotection. So this is a randomized trial led out of Holland that we're now using experimental drugs to try to reduce the size of injury in the newborn in the acute phase. Very exciting. First time we've ever been able to do that, um, but far from a cure. And the the sad truth is we're going to continue to see uh, permanent disability from perinatal stroke for a long time. And that's why a lot of our attention and the rest of this talk will be focused on rehabilitation. Uh, we see other strokes. This is that same story. This is an MRI scan, one day old baby. This time, 
black on that MRI scan means blood. So this is actually a hemorrhage or a breakage of a blood vessel in the brain. There, these are just different types of stroke. They create the same problems. And if you want to know, know more about hemorrhagic stroke, this is one of our papers that you could read. And then there are other types of stroke that occur in the fetus. Um, this is Mike. Uh, believe it or not, we have another incredible high-performance athlete, Paralympian medalist. Uh, Mike had a different stroke be long before he was born, actually, um, that gave him uh, some weakness on one side. Mike actually just emailed me today. He's uh, an active young, uh, he was a business student at the university. He's now doing great things. He's been a great advocate in our field. And if we looked at, if I showed you Mike's MRI, it would look like this one up at the top here, a different kind of stroke, a smaller stroke in a very specific location. Uh, our group and others have done some research about why this might occur. Um, but again, that same theory, before you're born, a focal injury leads to lifelong physical disability. The reason I'm showing you these examples is you'll see in a minute, it gives us models of where's the injury, what's the brain doing around the injury, because that's going to underlie the, the potential interventions. I'll skip over this for time. Okay, so what does a young brain do after it has a perinatal stroke? This, uh, this diagram is a simple uh, representation of development from, from left to right. Here's, you're born down here, and up here you become an adult. Let's say you're 18. And we all know that development goes very quickly uh, when you're little, um, and then everything starts to slow down, and then it's all downhill after 25. So, sorry to say, probably everybody on this call, almost everybody. Um, but these um, developmental curves, we're starting to understand what happens when you have a stroke at the beginning of life. And what seems to be true is that even though these injuries are very similar to each other and they occur at the same time, the developmental curves that follow for individual patients, as I told you at the beginning, are very different. Some young people do very well, like, like Mike or Alana, uh, but other kids we follow have a lot, uh, lot more problems. They have a much tougher time developing and they end up uh, as adults with much bigger difficulties. And so why the difference? You know, why would it be so different? This is really a lot of what our research program is about, is understanding the factors that might push kids up or down these developmental curves. And there's a bunch, there's too many to talk about today, but at the top are things like experience and what we call plasticity or um, use-dependent plasticity. Um, therapy that all these kids get is part of that, but is there a way for us to enhance that um, is really the concept that, that we're interested in. So these are, this is a summary of the outcomes from perinatal stroke. There's Mike again when he was young. Um, he's doing, this is an exercise he's doing with his therapist here in one of our programs. He's, you can see he's got some weakness on one side. So that's a form of cere cerebral palsy. We call it hemiparetic cerebral palsy. And it's the big problem after perinatal stroke. In fact, only about one out of every three or four kids ends up with other long-term neurological consequences like learning problems or epilepsy or, or uh, almost never language, which is really interesting. Um, so it's the motor system and, and that's where most of our rehab work focuses. So I'll focus uh, there. The only good news in perinatal stroke is the recurrence risk is virtually zero. Because um, as you might imagine, if you heard me say the placenta is the cause, of course, after you're born, the placenta is gone. So um, this, these strokes at least uh, never recur. So this cartoon on the left is important. So I'll just walk you through it briefly. Um, and sorry for those who are less familiar, but the, what I'm showing here is a, a model of the motor system. So it, this is like you're looking straight at somebody like these MRIs are. And if you looked in the middle part of the brain, you'd have a left motor cortex and a right motor cortex. And they send major pathways down to your spinal cord, which is what's shown here. And then your spinal cord sends nerve cells out to move the muscles on the opposite side of your body. And for most of us here, probably all of us, the way we're wired now that we're all adults is that the left motor cortex pretty much only controls the right hand because of these pathways that cross over. But if you introduce a brain injury, like a stroke on one side early in life, what often happens is these connections from the same side, the right side of the brain to the right hand, uh, we're all born with these connections, but they're supposed to disappear early in life. But if you have an early injury, you actually often hang on to these. And what it means is that a lot of these children are actually controlling their weak side, their weak hand, with some combination of both sides of their brain, which is very different than the way we're supposed to be built. And this is what we're interested in understanding because it gives us some ideas for, for therapy. 
So that's a cartoon and we can do this in animal models, but how would we ever actually model or map this in real patients? Well, these are just some pretty pictures of some of the tools that we use. So um, these are all uh, examples of MRI scans that we can now do in our, our research scanner in, at the children's. And I won't bore you with the details, but suffice it to say, you can ask the MRI data now to answer a thousand questions about not just where's the injury in the brain, but what has that done to the pathways and the connections and the networks in the brain? And how does that determine function? And so we've spent a lot of time doing this over the years. And I think Helen is our imaging scientist is gonna join us on the panel. So if you have any hard imaging questions, they go to, to Helen, not me. Um, this is a beautiful study from Brandon Craig who just finished his PhD with us. These are, look at these pictures, like they're just amazing uh, detail that we can uh, image in the brain now. And it can actually create models, not just of one spot in the brain, but the whole network, the whole connectivity of, of an entire hemisphere in the brain. And what Brandon found that's really fascinating is that, that that uninjured side of the brain, which I pointed to on the very first slide, is probably where all the action is. How it's developed and how its networks have formed uh, seems to be a major determinant of function. And if you really like these details, sorry for all the graphs, this is a, a beautiful paper that Brandon published uh, that, that highlights that. Uh, the other tool we use is uh, non-invasive brain stimulation called TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So here you can see we put a, a device called a coil over the motor cortex in the brain and we give a little magnetic stimulation. This activates the motor cortex and it produces a response in a, in a muscle on the other side of your body. You can see the hand jump, you can measure the response very safe. We've done over 4 million stimulations in over 400 children in, in, the, in the lab here. And so we have a lot of experience and, and it, it's very helpful. So here's a nice study from Ephraim Zudi, who's uh, one of our uh, leading team members. Um, you can imagine, if you remember the cartoon I showed you, here it is again, there's a stroke on this side. We give a magnetic stimulus on the other side. That's what this uh, little coil is up here. And in a bunch of the kids, you'll actually see a response in both hands. And so right away, that tells us about those ipsilateral or same-sided projections that I was pointing out. This, that's a very simple experiment with TMS. Turns out you can get a lot fancier from there, but we can use it combined with the MRI scans I just showed you to start creating these maps of motor development in, in real patients. And this is what it looks like. These are real kids with perinatal strokes who uh, generously allowed us to hand. share their Having videos. Two fingers together. So I'm asking him to tap his left hand here. And if you watch as he does these movements with his left hand, you'll see there's a mirror on the other side. He's doing a lot of the same movements. This is he's involuntary. This is because he's using the right side of his brain to control both hands. Good. Both hands up again. This is a nice study from Maddie Modell to show how well that correlates with the TMS results that I showed on the slide before. And TMS is getting really, really neat now. We can use uh, this robot that we have in our lab. We can register the patient's brain MRI scan with the robot in space. So the robot can go around and stimulate exactly where we want and create these maps. This is a map of, this is my younger son years ago in the, in the robot. Um, create a map of, this is a map on his brain of one individual muscle in his hand. So it's getting very precise, very discreet. Um, and uh, and there are other tools, but I want to I'm going to jump over that to make sure we stay on time. Um, so the, the take home message there is that if we use advanced technologies like MRI scans, brain stimulation, robots, we can create these individualized maps of what has a young person's brain done after it had a stroke at birth. Now it's developing. Um, where where are the where are the functions? How have they adjusted? And what these colorful cartoons are showing, this is a nice review article we just published if you want to read more, is that it's about all sorts of different parts of the network. We used to think just think about the motor cortex, the motor pathways, but of course the brain's more complicated than that. It includes the cerebellum, the thalamus, the basal ganglia, all these other um, important parts of the motor system. And so the models are getting smarter is the take home message. Um, so how do we use that information? This is the last part. How do you take that new knowledge and translate it into something that could actually help a child function better. Um, it's all this is all very interesting from the neuroscience point of view, but it's not very clinically relevant if you can't do something with it. So, so back to our cartoon of development. You remember I showed you the different outcomes and how we want to push kids up these developmental curves. Well, we know that 
using your body is helps. That's how your body learns, your motor system learns. And doing therapy, like occupational or physical therapy, probably helps you do that around an injury. But most of those don't work, to be frank, sorry to the therapists on the call, most of them don't work that well. We know therapy is far from a cure. In fact, it, it probably only works a little bit for some kids. So we need to make it better. We need to enhance that process. And that's where we get into this idea of, of neuromodulation or another form of brain stimulation that could help that. And this is where the sport trial comes from. And so I'll, I'll finish in the next few minutes and summarize uh, a couple of trials we've done with, with brain stimulation and, and what that might look like, set us up for the panel discussion. So the first trial we did was, a di was one type of brain stimulation, it's TMS again, this time given repetitively. And the take home point from this slide is that you can do it. Here's a young boy in the lab getting TMS repetitively over his motor cortex, but that's not just gonna magically create Function, new functions in his hand. That would be that would be nice, but it's not realistic. The key point is what's on the left here is intensive therapy. So here's Alana again. At the time, we did some video game type therapy. She's We didn't break her arm. This is a, a form of therapy called constraint therapy. So we put a cast on her good hand, forces her brain to use her weaker side. The key point here is you have to combine the stimulation with the therapy. You have to turn on the natural plasticity in the brain. Maybe then brain stimulation can augment or, or enhance that process. So, the, so all of these trials, the key is to combine intensive therapy with brain stimulation to see if it works. And so that first trial was called Plastic Chaps. This was using RTMS. And don't worry too much about the details. The point of this cartoon is to just show you the timeline of what it looks like. So we bring in a large group of kids, school-aged children with hemiparesis, weak one side because of a stroke. We characterize them in great detail. How do they work? What do their brain maps look like? And then they, in this case, they went into an intensive two-week camp, uh, customized therapy all day. And within that, they were randomized by a computer to get repetitive TMS or a, a fake version that you can't tell the difference of. So that's called a randomized control trial. And then we uh, measure them again at one week, um, two months, and six months to see if what we did actually made a difference. And that's a hard thing to do. This, this trial took years and millions of dollars, and it's, but a randomized trial is still the best way and often the only way to actually figure out if something's working. I mentioned that because if you start reading about brain stimulation after my talk today, if you Google it, you're gonna find all sorts of sensational things on the internet. Oh, brain stimulation can do this and do that. Unfortunately, most of that is not based in good evidence and randomized trials like them. Uh, so I wanna emphasize that point. The other point to emphasize is that the, the key is the natural plasticity. That comes from the, the therapist and the, the occupational child life therapists who design these camps to get the kids to turn on all that plasticity in a fun way that, that matters to them. So here's a bunch of kids from the first camp, sports, activities of daily living, cooking. This is rock band for those who don't know. Great ways to, to get kids to use their hands. And then we, we add the brain stimulation on top. And so the, to take home from the first trial, this measured, I'm sorry for the graphs, but uh, going up, these, this is all 45 kids together. These are their average scores. Each box is, is the group average. And this measure is telling us what the kids think about how satisfied they are with their ability to perform the goals that they set at the beginning of the camp. And what we found was that their satisfaction went up greatly after the camp. This is at baseline. They doubled their scores at one week after the camp. That's really good. What we worried was that with no more therapy, it might fade. But instead, when we measure them at six months, they've actually improved even more, which is really exciting. It maybe suggests we tip that developmental curve a little bit and they're, and they're doing better. We also use more objective measures. This The therapist administers this test called the AHA to actually measure their hand function. And again, sorry for the grasp. The point of this is that um, the kids who receive both brain stimulation and constraint therapy were more than twice as likely to achieve a significant growth in their AHA measure than the kids who got therapy alone. So this is the effect of the randomized trial. It doesn't prove that RTMS is, is necessarily even effective. It's suggested. It doesn't mean it's become the standard of care, but it's a first step in you know, answering the question, can brain stimulation enhance therapy? So then the other brain stim technique we use is called transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS. This is even simpler. Instead of using magnetic energy, this is electrical energy, a simple device, very safe. 
with a couple of sponge electrodes, puts a tiny little bit of electrical current through the scalp and onto the surface of the brain. You feel a little tingling, but it's, it's painless. And um, we did a variety of studies over the years, first to show that this can actually enhance motor skill learning in the hand. This had been shown in adults, but we needed to replicate that in children. And that's what this graph on the left is showing. These are kids, this is their performance on a simple task, putting pegs in a board. And the open triangles are, these are healthy school-age children. The open triangles are them learning over three days. They practice for 20 minutes. And you can see they, the upward trend, they're learning a skill. And RT is retention time six weeks later. If you test them again, they're faster. They can perform the skill better. So they've learned a new motor task. The top three curves are kids randomized to get active TDCS instead of the sham or the pretend version. And I, I can show you the statistics, but you can see clearly from this graph, the, the kids getting TDCS are learning better and it sticks, which is exciting. It means you can actually enhance motor learning in children. And this was the second trial we did that replicated those, those findings. So we've taken that to um, uh, kids with, again, perinatal stroke and cerebral palsy. This shows you the stages you have to go through to get here. I think this is an important point for today's discussion. We had to do the fundamental proof of principle studies, then we, and we also have to do what, what this is called a phase two trial. So we're still not trying to prove that it works, but we've got to do a small trial to show is it, is it, effect, is it safe, is it well tolerated, is it feasible? So this was a phase two trial, we call it. This is 24 kids. And it found that TDCS was all of those things, safe, well tolerated, and it suggested it probably worked. But that's what led us to the SPORT trial, and that's where I'll finish. So the SPORT trial, SPORT stands for Stimulation for Perinatal Stroke, Optimizing Recovery Trajectories. It was funded by the Childbright Network, which is a giant uh, CIHR SPORT funded uh, network focused on childhood disability. And what we did was taking all everything I just told you to the next level. So what's called a phase three trial, where we do a careful calculation. How many kids would we need to study this way to decide, can this method, TDCS, enhance motor learning in kids with perinatal stroke? And we had the knowledge and the model and the camps and the teams. We had to piece all that together. Trial cost about one and a half million dollars. It's not, not a small task. It took us five years. It was going to take us three, but thanks to COVID, it turned into five. We, this is a multi-center trial, so we're, we lead it in Calgary, but it's also run in Edmonton and Toronto. The, the importance of that is if it works, it shows you that it doesn't just have to be your, your, you doing it. You can actually teach other sites to do it. They can get the same results, hopefully. We don't know yet. And otherwise, it was really the same story I've already told you. Intensive, goal-directed learning in a camp-based model. These were kids at the end of one of our first camps um, uh, quite a few years ago in sport. Um, school age kids and um, randomized to get real or sham TDCS as part of their intensive therapy. And all, as well with all those measures before, just after, and at six months, including not just their hand function, but we did MRI scans, robotic measures, TMS mapping. Um, so it's been a really in-depth. And so I don't forget to say that the, the commitment of the families for these trials is massive. Um, so these families have committed not just to two weeks all day, every day, but a bunch of visits before and just after and up to six months after. We've had families come down from Edmonton to do some of the measures. We had a family from BC who relocated to Calgary for a month this summer just to participate. Um, so amazing sacrifices and commitment on the part of the kids and their families. I don't have the final results for you because we won't know until about February when we finish get our final six month outcomes. But we do have some nice early results. This was a, a text from one of the participants a couple summers ago, spontaneous, unsolicited, spontaneous text from his mom. Brandon's so excited. He can open his thumb. He couldn't do that before. Talk my ear off the whole way home. He says he wants the camp to last for a month instead of two weeks. And um, so this is uh, this is one kid's experience, but we love we love it. If this is a good outcome, no doubt about it. And uh, and these are the pictures from just uh, last month, the end of the trial. Uh, I get to be the uh, target for the water gun fight at the end. Um, and this nice picture shows a bunch of the team. This is a bunch of the kids from the last camp, uh, along with uh, Alicia and uh, some of our students and other team members who really make the these camps run. So um, a, a great experience uh, for me. Uh, I was going to skip over these boring neuroscience parts and finish because I want to get to the panel. Um, so, so that's really where the sport trial comes from. That's what it's about. 
the results, well, I'll tell you um, early in the new year, hopefully. Um, I honestly, I don't know what the results are going to be. Um, we've learned a million things and there's a million more uh, studies to come out of it. But the main question, does brain stimulation work? Can it enhance learning? Um, it's designed to answer that question. And I think we'll know um, uh, early in 2023. And the rationale, just to finish with that, that emphasis is, you know, how do we help the kids who have who have more severe disabilities to have these, you know, enormous successes um, that others have had um, around these uh, uh, perinatal brain injuries? Um, that's the remains the motivation, and and uh, hopefully we get there. If you want to know more, our our main website perinatalstroke.ca has lots of this information. Um, these are some of our other social media and, and websites. If you want to know more. And I'll stop there with thanks to the team, most of which is shown here, and some of whom are joining us, I think. And uh, thanks also to our, my funding, especially CIHR, who funded the Child Bright, uh, the uh, sport trial. And uh, thanks for your attention and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Curtin. We're now going to open it up um, to the panel. So I'm going to introduce our three additional panelists. We have Megan Metzler, who is an occupational therapist and research clinician at the Alberta Children's Hospital. We have Jackie Hodge, who is the research coordinator for the Calgary Pediatric Stroke Program, and Dr. Helen Carlson, who is a research assistant professor in pediatrics um, and with the Calgary Pediatric Stroke Program. Um, so I'm just going to start off with a might be the easiest question, might be, might be the hardest one. Um, but for those of you who were involved in the sport camp and the sport trial and in the day-to-day -day pieces, can you share a favorite moment from the camp? I can start. Um, I have a favorite moment. It was the 2019 camp and one of our little guys, um, he had this was his third clinical trial camp that he had participated in with, um, with us. And his dad came to me one day um, by the elevators at the Children's Hospital and he said to me, I don't know what you guys did, but so-and-so has made his first friend at school. And this is um, knowing this little guy and he is so sweet and, um, you know, but he had some struggles and and had had some struggle, struggles at school as well. And so hearing his dad just, I mean, maybe it was part of our camp, maybe it wasn't, you, you don't really know, um, but for him to have made his first friend and it was something really special. Um, that same child in a previous camp, a few years earlier, um, I was working with him on his break and, and in that camp break time was um, just playing games, um, still focused on using their non-dominant hand. And so we were playing this game called topple where you had to pick up, um, you have to have this function and, and pick up these little pieces and put them on a wobbly board. And we were probably day three or four into the two week camp and he had a really hard time. Um, sometimes he could like pick it up, but he, he couldn't open his fingers once he was um, holding something. And yeah, I think it was day three or four and he was able to put it on and he opened it up. And he was so excited and so happy. And he said to me, oh, my hand just gets better every single day. And he, you know, he's like seven years old or something. And so that's the same child that both of my two favorite moments were, were with him. And there's many more, but I'll, I'll stop there. Um, my favorite moment, I think, was um, this past camp um, after the guacamole eating contests. Um, that was delicious. That was one of my previous camp favorites, um, was uh, this recent camp uh, watching a, a boy ride his bike for the first time on caught on video. Um, he rode his bike for the first time without training wheels uh, because of course his uh, one of his hands worked better. He could grasp the handlebars a lot better. So just uh, having a nice video from a family was amazing as uh, just a huge validation of all the tough work that was done by the kids and also the families and also the team. It's super rewarding. There are lots of great moments. I think everyone's kind of alluded to that a little bit. It's hard to pick one. And there have been, this is the fourth year that we've uh, run the camp. 
Um, but I think the clearest one in my mind is this past summer, one of the kids who maybe has a bit of a more severe impairment, maybe you don't expect to see gains that are quite as big, um, who at one point just like shouted out in the middle of the therapy session, I've reached all my goals, <laughs> kind of like, <laughs> and she, yeah, she was just really proud of herself. So I think um, one of the themes that comes up is not just kids meeting their motor gains, but also um, the, so the social and psychological impacts of um, just making those goals and then and then seeing progress. So it's your turn, Adam. Yeah, it's hard to pick. I, I echo all the previous comments. Those Each of those personalized sort of anecdotes are, they're the best for sure. I think one slightly different one was at the end of our, our family wrap-up event that we have this year, Alana, who I introduced you to in the talk, um, who I think oh, we were trying to get to come today. It's too bad it didn't work out, but um, the, um, she agreed uh, to volunteer her time. She came on the second to last afternoon, spent the afternoon with the kids, and then came to the family event and gave us a, a, little, a great speech. Actually, I didn't, I didn't, I'd never heard her give a speech before. And I was like, "Do you want to?" And then, "Are you?" And she goes, "Yeah, I can do that." And so we just gave her the mic, and it was brilliant because she had connected with these kids. She was actually reminiscing about her first time in the camp, and she's like, "Oh, I had the same goal as you," or, you know. And now she's there standing up there as this young adult with this Olympic medal around her neck and showing it to the kids. And it was this really nice sort of full circle, um, you know, uh, uh, completion of the process that started so many years ago. And um, so I think that's my most recent favorite highlight. It was really great. Yeah. Totally good Thank you each for taking a moment to share those very touching and very, very exciting moments from the camp. I know I know that we have a very diverse group here joining us today. Um, some of my questions are going to be very, very focused on a programming side of things, um, specifically in sport and recreation context. Would you say that for coaches and instructors, there is benefit to having measurable, quantifiable goals and goal attainment models built into that sport and recreation program, just based on what you're seeing in your trials. Megan, you want to take that one? Yeah, I was just thinking as the OT in the room, I kind of have a bias because <laughs> we like to focus on function and client-centered goals. So I think there's a huge advantage um, in not just in terms of motivation, but also making sure that the things that you're focusing on will translate into real life and actually have an impact on a child's life. So absolutely, um, client-centered goals, goals that matter to them. I think there, um, there are a few things to keep in mind with that. There's usually a little bit of a dance and a negotiation between a therapist and a parent and a child in terms of choosing goals that are the most relevant and attainable and realistic. So I think that um, there are some things to keep in mind from the sport context. It's about not just um, letting Johnny pick whatever whim comes into their mind at, their, at the moment, um, but it's more of a team input into deciding on what those goals are. And that's definitely the model that we've, that has been in place for all of these interventional camps that have come through Adam's lab. That's a great, great, Megan. And I would just add one perspective, um, well, maybe two. The uh, one is that um, Megan's giving me too much credit because when we started doing these, uh, I was trained as a neurologist. And so I used to be very much on the body structure and function. For people who don't know, there's this international classification of disease, and it starts with body structure and function, and, and then it thinks about activity, and then it thinks about participation. And as a neurologist, we're all trained to sit on the body structure and function. We're trained to measure, and I can test your strength and your reflexes, and I can say where the lesion is in the brain. 
that's all kind of interesting, but it's it's practically useless in the real world because and, and it, I had to be converted by by therapists like Megan and others to pay attention to forget about the body structure, not forget about it, but only consider it in the context of what's the activity, like the bike riding example Helen gave, and really the participation. So can he ride his bike? Yes. Is he now out riding his bike with his buddies? That's the goal. That's if if that's the patient's goal. This is why I'm bringing it up to your question, Leticia. I think um, to me, that's why goal settings become so important. Um, the other reason is in the context of a clinical trial, we our goal is to measure. You know, can we make a difference? Can we actually? And our our goal is to for them to achieve their goals. Therefore, you need to measure the goals and how they change accurately to decide if your intervention is actually doing something. So I think um, there are different circumstances. You asked about coaching or personal training. I, I imagine, I'm not an expert there. I imagine there's a psychology and other reasons to quantify and show progress and those things. But from our point of view, it's clinically relevant for the first point I made. And it's scientifically relevant because you need to, you need careful measurements of, of your most important outcomes if you want to you know, run a good trial and, and answer an important question. I'm going to add one point because you made me uh, something you said made me think of this, Adam. But for a lot of families, because change is incremental when you're learning a new skill, um, they don't really have a great awareness of sometimes the big leap in function or progress that they've made over a period of time. So even in clinical practice, I find that those objective measures can be really helpful, even um, to help a child and a parent recognize the gains that they've made. So I think that would apply to a sport context as well. For sure, yeah. Okay. On to the next question. So as a coach in sledge hockey, as an individual who's had an opportunity to be an instructor at the adapted camps, we've been able to host at the U of C. And in my role as a researcher, um, I've had the opportunity to meet many athletes, many parents. Um, some of them have their personal goals. Some of them, their parental, their, their parents' goals are very therapy-based when bringing them into a sport and recreation context. Others are there simply, you know, this is this is sport and recreation. It, it's all about having fun. And for others, certain programs are, are about the therapy. Um, is there a similar model to constraint therapy or constraint therapy that you would recommend or encourage the use of in those contexts? I can let Megan comment on the, the constraint specifically. The what I, one angle of your question I was considering, and Jackie might have a comment, is the you're I'm referring to sort of the parental motivation and. Um, I wanted to emphasize the point I made about the the level of commitment from the parents and the families, which is we we've, we've learned is just um, very very impressive. Usually, very highly committed and dedicated. Those motivations, and I don't know if Jackie wants to comment. Those motivations certainly vary across families, right? So that also is about the personalized nature of this. We're mostly interested in what the kids want to do, but parents obviously have a substantial influence on that. And I think we, I don't know, what do you think, Jack? Yeah, like, I think we've seen parents engage in our camps successfully for a broad variety of motivations. Some it's just like, I just want them to make friends or I just, you know, this sounds great. Or another's like, I heard this is like the cutting edge and you can't get it anywhere else. So we want to do it. Or or some would be very specific, you know, um, they've helped them set their goals. I want to tie my shoes and cut my stake. And they're like, yes, that's what, that's what we want. Um, the parental motivation is, it's a whole other factor here about, um, you know, why families participate. And um, yeah, that, that would be my comment. I would agree that there is a range of motivations uh, from the parent side. Um, some parents uh, leave it up to their child completely, whether or not they want to participate. Um, and they can be quite hands off with the goal setting and, and things like that. Whereas other parents, um, I don't want to say force, but definitely see the benefit of the camp and 
um, that child is coming, whether they want to or not. You also have to take into consideration the child's age. And so, if, you know, if the child's 12 and doesn't want to come to camp, well, 12 year old kids probably don't want to do anything. So once they come and, and enjoy, you know, first day is always the hardest, but by the end of the two weeks, I've never known anyone who was upset that they attended the camp, parent or child. So, um, but I would say mostly the parents, some parents, I mean, every parent's different. Some parents just like that it's a two week ca camp that's free that their kid can go to. Um, but then you have to remember we've done camps throughout the entire school year that were two weeks as well. And so those parents took their kids out of school for two weeks for our camp. And we probably did, I don't know, eight of those, Adam? 10 maybe so the level of commitment from those parents was you know the they were prioritizing their child's function over their child's education at that point so um yeah I would say that's my comment that's great I have a great video I could try and pull it up here but we, we did these exit videos from some of the early camps and there's a great one of Mike who I introduced you to and he was like 12 I think and he was this kind of like you know serious pre-adolescent like Syriot wanted to be an athlete, wanted to be a bike racer. And there's a great clip from his dad. His mom's like, oh, it was so great. And, and you know, whatever. but his dad comes on, he's like, he did not want to do this. He thought it was going to be stupid. <laughs> like, and he, we have, we put all the quotes right in the video. And then he said, but at the end, it, you know, he completely flipped and, and really thought he got a lot out of it. And then little serious Mike was like, I think I learned a lot and I was, you know, it really helped me. And, um, Anyway, just those those parental perspectives are very uh, are very telling, I think. So one uh, one aspect of what you talked about was uh, the constraint, Letitia. I think one of the big differences between these types of trials and maybe um, some sport programming is a lot of um, what we've done in the camp was one on one, which meant that we could tailor things pretty heavily. Um, so parents may have um, specific functional goals and kids may have just wanted to have fun, um, but there was enough flexibility that we could probably, we could do those things. So we could still meet those functional goals, but then for example, we had one little guy last summer and if you could come up with a creative way to incorporate a car into that functional movement, um, you had them. So using those types of things where you're taking um, the child's interests and what's motivating for them, and then applying that so you're um, making progress towards that functional goal is often the type of strategy that we would use. Okay, I would like to now open it up to everyone. Um, open Q&A, you're welcome to direct your questions to any of our panel members. Enrico. Thank you. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to just uh, applaud you on a tremendous presentation. You're, you and your entire team, it's just the incredible work you're doing is really, um, really impressive so thank you so much for the presentation and this idea for this question kind of came to me uh, when you were introducing us to some of the very successful individuals who've recovered from perinatal stroke and their their impressive involvement in paralympic sport for example so this is my area a little bit more tbi and exercise and given the role that physical exercise can play in promoting brain plasticity after you know brain injury such as through the upregulation of proteins like brain-derived neurotropic factor, the types of physical activities that these, these children could be involved with in a sport camp. I was curious to ask if you controlled for or considered monitoring their PA levels based on the influential role that that might be contributing to assisting with their motor development and abilities as well. Yeah, I can start. That's a great question. Um... It was certainly considered, it's a hard, as you probably know, it's a hard thing to control for the, um, uh, and it particularly with, and Megan might have a comment here with the, with the goal setting and, you know, we really try to get to know each kid before, as they come into the program and their goals are set. There's a, obviously a huge range of baseline um, physical activity. Um, we try to control a little bit in terms of 
you know, change in therapy programs. We, we try to ask the families to kind of lock into what they're currently doing for the period of the trial to try to at least reduce the noise. Like if a kid took up a whole new intense activity right in the middle of camp, it would, you know, potentially um, obviously influence our results. Um, but to control for, and I guess we do also have, um, uh, we have actigraphy data. This is a good question, actually. Maybe you'd like to see our actigraphy data. We need some help with it. Um, what I mean, for those who don't know, actigraphy is like a, you know, like a Fitbit. Um, we um, have done a few studies, and in the sport trial, we tried. It's actually harder than it sounds, but we had the kids wear actigraphs on both hands so that we had a continuous sort of real world measure of how much their upper extremities were moving. Mm -hmm. And a few of our team members have done a few studies in healthy children compared to children with hemiparesis, because as opposed to most of the other tests we do in a bit of an artificial environment, that would capture, you know, real world daily activity. And you could, we thought you could just ratio the good, I thought, naively, you could just ratio the good arm to the bad arm. And you'd be like, oh, now I can see how much you are relatively using your good side versus your weaker side. And we'll see if that changes through the trial. We haven't done that whole analysis yet. Um, of course, body movements and activities are much more complicated than that. Um, but it would, it, it would at least in part, I'm quite sure, reflect um, their, their daily, although we don't have it on them for endless number of days, they're a bit of a, it's a bit of random sampling, um, but it would in some way perhaps reflect what their, the, their activity level in their daily lifestyle might be. Um, that, that might be something worth looking at. I, you're, I agree with you, it should be considered, were we able to, to measure it or control for it more than those two points I just made? Um, uh, not really. Megan, did you have some thoughts there? Yeah, I thought of the actigraphy data as well. It's a little bit messy just because as we discovered, kids um, have some segmented movement with their paretic arm. So those counts that you see um, from the paretic arm are a little bit different and it therefore may not give you kind of a baseline of their overall physical activity, but that might be something to consider. Um, we, we have actigraphy data at all different points in the trial. So they wear it um, for a 48 uh, hour period prior to the trial starting. They wear it all throughout the trial. And then uh, I think they wear them, yeah, they do wear them again at two months and then six months. So I think within that, that might give us a little bit of data to look at. Um, other than that, we're not necessarily tracking their physical activity. I do have to say though, during the trial itself, um, they're generally, they're here for eight hours a day and almost universally kids and families have told me they're so exhausted. They just kind of go home and they vegetate. So I think we have a pretty good idea that during the trial itself, it's we're controlling physical activity <laughs> among all the kids. We're suppressing, <laughs> suppressing after well, hours physical activity. Um, other, we do have some gross motor programming built into the camp for the kids and they do it all together. So um, it's not going to be perfectly universal, but I think it's fairly well controlled during the camp itself for the, for the, the campers. I'll add one more, one more comment on your question that we should also look at is, um, I don't know if you remember, but in the plastic champs, the first trial, I showed how their, at least their personal perception of gains actually went up between the end of the camp and six months. And we have some different theories for that, but I, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but we have, we also had um, this PEDS quality of life measure that had different segments in it. One of which is called physical or motion and activity or something like that. So it's a subjective rating of of how much they're participating in, I think, in physical activity. I, I can't claim how validated that is, but we did see shit. We saw shifts in that curve suggesting that um, I think the after effects part of your question is if we can sh convince some kids that they are capable of change or allow them to achieve some small but noticeable change, does that shift their, their participation? Does it make them more likely to do more physical activity or take up a new a hobby or activity, because maybe that's what keeps them pushing up the, the developmental curve. So 
I wonder if there may be positive after effects on physical activity. And maybe that's a feed forward, because as you say, more physical activity, more, you know, more enhancement of what's just called brain plasticity. Um, if, if those things could feed each other, maybe you set them onto a new, an improved trajectory for their, for their motor development. Fascinating. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Dr. Conliffe? Sorry, having problems getting my mute button. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, you, you guys know I think these are great camps, and and uh, obviously, more importantly, the the participants do too. One of the things that I think is is so special about them is that they are really clearly fun recreational opportunities that are also delivering a therapy, and and for many people in the audience may not be uh, as aware that often uh, therapy isn't delivered in quite such a group fun recreational way and and often our adapted uh, physical activity fun programs aren't so clearly therapy and delivering a, a therapy and uh, I, I just uh, wonder if if you uh, have any other strategies for how we can get these two things programmatically together more often. Uh, I'll let Megan uh, or the others comment. My my overall thought is um, it's really about integrating research and clinical with, and not just by clinical, I mean all elements of clinical. So allied health, uh, expert therapists like Megan, but child life therapists like Lisa, who I think is here and who helped design the whole program and translate it out to the other sites, um, therapy assistants, uh, a bunch of students, research students, just young people who are creative and make it fun. Um, and to give credit also, I, I should have said it, to the system here, so AHS and our neuro, the neuroscience managers here, who've been open to this concept, and in fact, it's leading to some new ideas for how to integrate uh, allied health clinicians with research programs. Ten years ago, there was no constraint therapy program. We designed the Plastic Champs trial and said, we need constraint, <laughs> and they were like, we don't know how to do it, and the, the trial kind of made it start. But then we got buy-in from the therapists and the, and the clinical uh, administrative leaders. That's hard to find. I think we're actually pretty mm -hmm. unique that way. But um, I think creating those uh, types of programs, it needs buy-in from the, all those parties um, to work. Um, I think that's why ours has been, been relatively successful. Uh, Dr. Conliff, it's a great question. I don't know that there is a magic answer. I think Adam's comment is a good one because the times when I've seen it work really well is generally when there's been this partnership between uh, clinical and research programs because those two um, fields together seem to have all the pieces necessary to make it work. Um, sometimes clinically there aren't the resources or, well, generally it's a, often it's a resource issue. Um, and then on the research side, I, I feel like you need the clinical piece so that it's relevant for the kid. These are really highly intensive um, camps. We individualize the programs to kids. Um, they have their own specific goals. We pick target movements that are specific to each child. So then we're planning programming um, that is going to fit the child's interests and what's motivating for them as well as therapeutically. So there's a, a large commitment um, in order to make that happen. I think um, the other thing is it takes a lot of skill. Um, so students, we, we have occupational therapy students that help support this program. That's part of the way we get around the resource issue. Um, and it it is a lot of um, mentorship and training and um, coaching in order to get all of those magic pieces to come together. So um, we find that a lot. Sometimes it's the right target movement, but it's not fun or engaging. And so then you have to go back to the drawing board. So um, I don't have the magic answer, but um, I think that would be uh, the one thing to consider, it takes a lot of resources and expertise.
Okay, um, with that, I see the time and we're a couple of minutes over. I would just really, really like to thank Jackie, Megan, Helen, and Adam for joining us today, for sharing what I'm sure is just one piece of all the work, all the incredible work that they are doing. Um, and thank everyone for joining us over the lunch hour. Have a great day. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thanks everyone.